Gaijin Entertainment presents The Shooting Range You're watching The Shooting Range, a weekly show for all tankers, airmen, and aspiring captains in War Thunder. In this episode, genius, philosopher, engineer, philanthropist, meet Hideo Itokawa and his KI-43, where rural life meets the latest achievements in engineering. Welcome to the 38th Parallel. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you left in the comments. But first, let's start with... Yet another Japanese newcomer, the Mighty Type 60 SPRG. The Type 60 self-propelled 106mm recoilless gun is another reason why the Japanese armor deserves to be treated with a degree of fear and respect. Fear and respect, you say? Just look at it! A light tank with barely any armor and almost no crew protection that is also a chore to drive. Why should I fear such an enemy? There's a damn good reason. Two reasons, in fact. The Type 60 mounts not one, but two M40 106mm recoilless rifles as its main armament. Yeah, it has a low ammo count with only 10 shots, but these are heat rounds that can penetrate up to 300 mm of armor. So, no one can escape your wrath, even the enemies with the toughest of hides. Moreover, don't forget that you can fire your gun separately, which allows for some amazing short burst damage. Just change your key bindings for that. The vehicle also has a pretty low profile, which means that you can hide behind even the smallest of obstacles. Burned out tanks, piles of rocks, craters, everything works, really. Trust us, you'll need every bit of cover you can find. The Type 60 shines if you use it as a support and or ambush vehicle. If you push solo, the best case scenario is that you'll get the first two opponents rushing to the point. If there are a couple of teammates nearby and you find yourself a comfy, non-trivial spot, that's a completely different story. Wait for your comrades to engage the enemy first, then ambush the hell out of the opponents, striking from the sides or attacking them while they're reloading. A few extra tips. Make every shot count. Remember, the only way for you to get ammo is to return to the point, and ain't nobody got time for that. The rangefinder is your friend. Knowing the distance to your target will make it much easier to land accurate shots. Do not be afraid to expose your turret. You have three crew members, so even after you take a shot up there, you can still retreat to safety. Artillery strikes and machine guns are the real threats. Never expose yourself to them, and you'll do just fine. Sometimes one man can save the day, even when the military are asking for something almost impossible. The KI-27 proved to be such a successful design that as early as in 1937, its creators at the Nakajima Aircraft Company were asked to create another fighter aircraft. The requirements were stiff and, as some believed, contradictory. The new fighter had to be significantly faster than the KI-27 with the top speed of 500 km an hour or 311 miles an hour, and also have at least the same level of maneuverability. Koyama Yasushi, a seasoned veteran of aircraft design and the creator of the KI-27, tried his best and failed. The first prototype was a complete disappointment. Pilots complained that it lacked the responsiveness and the maneuverability of the previous Nakajima plane. Under these circumstances, the team could only hope for a stroke of genius. Luckily enough, they found a right man for the job. The man who was loved and hated in equal measure and went by the name of Hideo Itokawa. Who was he? Just a brilliant engineer and an inventor, a gifted athlete and a musician, a philosopher and a multi-field scientist to boot. He also didn't give a damn about ideology, subordination and corporate ladder. In the stiff world of pre-war Japan, Hideo Itokawa sticked out like a red circle in a field of pure white. But this stubborn know-it-all had a knack for finding great solutions, and he delivered once again. 
he suggested that the KI-43 has to be outfitted with Fowler-type maneuvering flaps. The team went silent. Everybody knew that you could not install this type of flaps on a fast aircraft. Heck, even the great Willy Messerschmitt had to drop the idea when he used the designs of the BF-108 Typhoon, an excellent sports aircraft, to make his BF-109. Here is the thing. In this idle state, the regular flaps are just there, a part of the wing. You have to deploy them to extend them into the airflow. When you stop pushing them out, the stream automatically pushes them back and locks them in place. Just picture a door closed by a draft. That's basically the same thing. With Fowler-type flaps, it's exactly the opposite. The flap is pushed open by the force exerted by the airstream, and you have to do some work if you want to retract it. Now imagine unlocked Fowler-type flaps at high speeds. The airflow would literally try to tear them off. By the time flap gets to the end of its slide, it has so much kinetic energy that it can easily break away, along with a part of the wing. And we don't want that, do we? Given the advantages of this type of flaps, it's not surprising that the best minds of the industry spent years trying to solve this problem, but they failed. Hideo Itokawa solved the riddle in one day. He invented a kind of an inertial locking mechanism. If a flap was detracting too fast, the mechanism would immediately lock it in place. Just like that. If that doesn't impress you, think of thousands, no, millions of lives that this mechanism saved in the following years. We're talking about the locking retractors that everybody has in their seat belts. Yes, it's basically Itokawa's lock that stops the belt from extending during severe deceleration. But let's get back to KI-43. With its new flaps installed, it magically got the ability to cut very tight turns at considerable speeds. Needless to say, the military was sufficiently impressed, and without further ado, the aircraft went into production. Itokawa-type flap was so successful that it almost became a kind of a signature design solution for Nakajima aircraft. The top brass drew the right conclusions and suggested that Itokawa should lead the work on the next fighter for the army. But he declined the offer, simply because he believed that it was amoral to design machines that were only suited for killing. Itokawa was probably the only engineer in wartime Japan who could say that and go away unscathed. And that he did. Later he became the pioneer of the Japanese rocketry and the father of the Japanese space development. And when rival Soviet and American scientists offered him lavish sums to buy the translation rights of his famous work on zero-gravity surgery, he declared that the book could be translated by anyone for free. He was also very fond of music. Like a fictional genius that we all know, Itokawa really enjoyed playing the violin and often indulged himself in some music making right at his workplace. At expense of his more earthbound colleagues, of course. This brilliant mind left us in 1999, and the humanity found a suitable way to honor his memory. In the sky there is now an asteroid named 25143 Itokawa, and in 2005 we successfully landed on it using a spacecraft called Hayabusa, just like the KI-43 that Itokawa worked on. Nope, we're not leaving Asia today. Welcome to the rice fields of the 38th parallel. The map consists of three zones. In the west, you'll find a picturesque village that, at a first glance, looks like a good place for some good old urban warfare. Nothing can be further from truth. Shells pierce these rickety walls with no effort, so do not expect to get much cover from them, especially in arcade battles. What's really interesting is that you don't even have to go in there. To the right, there is a small ravine, a natural corridor that is a great place for some dueling. Don't forget to use every bit of elevated terrain for high ground advantage. Look at this position, for example. It is available for all tankers coming from the spawn point in the north. Get behind the rock, you're all set. What of you? Both teams have access to roads that connect all control zones. This is amazing news for light vehicles. You can quickly come to the aid of your teammates in almost any part of the map mount lighting fast attacks and shift another team's attention to any of the control zones. 
the possibilities are endless. What's even better, these roads are pretty safe in terms of cover. Snipers have to really work it to score some eliminations here. If we follow the road, we get to the first bloodbath type control point of the map. It's the center point. There is a military camp that is as easy to assault as the central point in Tunisia, which means that it's actually really, really difficult to do. Because almost all of it is a big kill zone. If you get caught in the open, you're almost asking for a shell from one of the elevated positions around it. There are a few spots that provide sufficient cover and concealment, but this point is clearly not a place for solo heroics. To mount a successful assault, you need some team effort. Get some buddies together and show everybody who's boss. If you're into hardcore Mexican standoffs, please come to the zone near the dam in the eastern side of the map. There are precious few rocks scattered around. Lucky to get behind one? Well, get ready for a typical bar shootout. Take a peek from your overturned table, I mean, we, we mean cover. Send a shell or two, get back to safety, rinse and repeat. Classic. A few more tips. Light vehicles as well as other vehicles with great mobility can try to get to the rice fields straight from their spawn zones. It's not easy, but it can be done, and, at least in RB, the enemies will not expect you to see them right from the start of the match. Be active. 38th parallel is not a corridor map. There are always plenty of alternate routes. A simple change of position will make it really hard for your enemies to pursue you. With so many options around, it's not easy to predict anybody's movement. Remember, the same thing applies to your opponents. Have anything to add? Please tell us what you think about the new map in the comments below. Finally, it's time for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official forums. Here we'll have a more light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. We'll hope you like it. MAB writes, When will you rework the sounds in the game? Cannons, engines, turret traverse, explosions, etc.? Also, implement national crew voices, please. Hey, buddy, we literally never stop working on our sounds. Check the patch notes and see for yourself. And we've just implemented exactly the thing that you're asking for – national crew voices. You just have to download some audio files by selecting a desired language in our launcher that you can switch back to your preferred language version, of course, and by choosing the corresponding voice pack and the options. The second question comes from a player called Le Game Musical. Dear Gaijin, will you improve damage effect caused by plane ramming into tanks and boats? I want to be a kamikaze pilot. Too bad, friend. We believe that kamikaze-like tactics should not be encouraged. It just doesn't take too much skill to destroy an enemy this way. And at what cost? Where's fun in that? Evenhead711 asks, Hey Gaijin, are you still working on the World War mode? I'm not going to bother asking when it will be released because I know that you keep that confidential. Thanks for understanding, mate. It's not about confidentiality, though. We just don't like to talk about things we're not 100% sure of. And yes, we are indeed working on it. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range!